Hi everyone, um, so my name is Michelle Densham. I'm a bereavement midwife at Bolton Hospital. I've been a midwife for just over five years and a bereavement midwife for just over two years. Um, Bolton's quite a large hospital in Greater Manchester. We've got about six and a half to seven thousand births a year. And um, as bereavement midwives, we care for women having any pregnancy losses over 16 weeks. We also care for women having early neonatal deaths in the first 28 days of life and it adds up to about 100 families a year. Um, I'm gonna start with a quote, and this is a quote that came from one of my friends when she found out I was speaking today. Um, Hannah and Andrew have got three gorgeous girls. Uh, their first daughter, Rosie, was stillborn at term plus four. Uh, their second daughter, Isabel, was stillborn at 36 weeks, and their third daughter, Evelyn, was born at 37 weeks at the end of last year and is now four months old and has us all wrapped around her little finger. Um, and I think it's quite a controversial statement to start the day on, but I think it's probably a fairly standard reaction. Um, and I think it's difficult for people to see what can be excellent about bereavement care, especially within maternity. Um, the idea of providing bereavement care can be quite daunting for a lot of people, a lot of midwives and it doesn't always necessarily factor into why we choose this career. Um, and I think one reason that we can find it so difficult is that for better or for worse, healthcare professionals in general, we're fixers, we wanna fix things. We spend our careers and our training learning as much as we can so that we can make things better. And bereavement isn't something that you can fix. Um, it's, it's just not. This is another quote that I heard from, um, I overheard one of our midwives speaking to one of our students. And it's, it seems like a very simplified quote, but actually it's, it kind of makes sense. Uh, we can lose sight of the fact that what we're doing is providing support and care to a family at the birth of their child. The idea of the loss and the grief could be overwhelm everything else. And I'm not saying that we should disregard those things, but to some extent, we need to come back to the fact that it's about providing care to new families, not just bereaved families. Um, and a lot of the times, what parents need is just more, more of your time, more of your patience, more understanding, uh, just more. And uh, I think coming alongside these families is, is an amazing privilege, and it can be one of the most beautiful things that you do in your career. So I'm just gonna go through, it's kind of the fundamentals, I think, really, um, of providing care. Oh, I thought I'd get rid of the slide. So this is just a very brief timeline. I thought I'd taken it out, but it just shows some of the changes that have happened over the last 100 years, but it also highlights some of the changes that still need to happen. And I'm just gonna skip past it because I didn't realize it was still in there. Um, I promise all my slides aren't just quotes, but this is the last one for now. Uh, but it's just, it's just quite an interesting one. So in providing bereavement care, I think the things that we need to think about are compassion, choices, communication, training and education, looking after ourselves, and then also the practicalities as well. Uh, bear with me. So when we're providing care, we need to make sure that it's parent-led. Uh, no two families are going to be the same in their reactions or their processing in how they want to deal with things. Um, but one thing is universal is the need and the right to dignity and respect, not just for parents, but for their baby as well. And what we need to remember overall is that care is about a family on the journey to meeting their baby for the first time. And our jobs as midwives and healthcare professionals is to make sure that time is as precious and as special as can be. We need to make sure care is holistic. We should be trying to provide holistic care that encompasses physical, emotional, spiritual, and cultural needs um, without making assumptions based on those, that knowledge that we have. We need to find a balance between educating ourselves on the things that are common um, in certain religions or cultures, but then not limiting care based on those things. So a quick example is that we have a lot of um, Orthodox Christian families in Bolton, and we know that generally they prefer burials rather than cremations, but that doesn't mean that we don't offer cremations as well. And um, 
quite a big one that we realised early on was that a lot of our midwives assumed that some of our Muslim families wouldn't want photographs of baby. So they weren't offering them. And that's just massive. It's a massive opportunity that's been lost for those parents to, to make those memories. And as soon as we kind of pointed it out and they started offering them, they were amazed at how many parents jumped at that chance. And I'm sure the parents here will all agree that photographs with their babies is one of the most precious things that you can have. Um, yeah. Sensitive care, it kind of should go without saying, um, but I'm gonna say it anyway. So, actually I'm gonna go back to holistic care. So I talked a little bit about um, kind of cultural things. And the physical care as well is important. And while it's important to remember the physical care, so all the checks and antenatal checks and everything, it's important to make sure that these things don't take over. I think it can be easy as midwives and as student midwives to fall back on the things that we know how to do and maybe neglect some of the emotional stuff because it, it's harder to do. Um, but in terms of emotional care, I think it comes back to remembering that it's not just, it's just not in our power to fix anything. And there's very little as healthcare professionals that we can do to make, thing, make baby loss better. Um, but what we can do is offer a listening ear. Um, we can offer time. We can offer understanding and patience. Parents are gonna be dealing with a lot of emotions and a lot of choices, and you can provide a safe place for parents to process these things. Uh, and I think the emotional side is a big worry for a lot of people. I think people worry about how they're gonna cope with their own emotions. Um, and it is a case of finding a balance between not coming across as detached, but also not letting your grief overtake the parents' grief. And I'm not saying that you can't cry with parents because that's actually, you know, showing your human side to parents is okay. Um, but it's making sure that they're still the for forefront. Um, so now I'll go on to sensitive care. So there's a lot of difficult decisions and conversations that have to be had when a baby dies and parents are gonna have a lot of questions and um, make a lot of decisions that no parent should ever have to make. And it's important that we give parents as much information as we can, but without overloading them or just bombarding them. Um, I remember having words with a doctor fairly recently who within minutes of performing an ultrasound scan and saying those words that Emma said, was then talking about a post-mortem examination. And it was just, I got her out of the room fairly quickly and we had words. But you know, there are times for conversations and that wasn't fair that time. Um, we also need to make sure our care is non-judgmental. And this seems fairly obvious, but yeah. Um, parents need to know that they're in a safe place without fear of judgment. Um, for most people, baby loss is a completely alien alien subject. We talk a lot about the wall of silence that is around baby loss. And um, a lot of people don't, you know, when it happens to them, they think, they don't realise that it still happens in the UK, that babies still die at term. Um, so they just, they don't know how they're going to react. They don't know. The idea of seeing baby and spending time with baby can be quite a daunting thing. Um, so it's, it's important that we try and promote these things and kind of encourage parents um, without being judgmental. So we need to let them know that they can cry, they can be scared, they can be angry, that it's okay if they don't want to see baby straight away, um, that they're not sure if they want photographs, but that we're here, there to help guide parents through these things. Um, one thing that I find is that parents ask permission quite a lot, permission to hold baby or take photos. And it just, it makes me so sad because it's still, it's their baby and they shouldn't have to ask permission. Um, but they worry what people think, especially if their parents are around, I think, because a lot of older people, they still have that, that attitude that it should be swept under the carpet. If you don't think about it, it's not as bad. Just move on. And, um, but yeah, I think that permission to spend time with baby and just carry on is, you can see people just physically react, uh, just phys physically relax. And um, I had a dad one day that would prepared him that baby might have a couple of nosebleeds and stuff, and, and he did. And um, he just, 
he was worried about baby deteriorating beforehand, but as soon as it started to happen, he, his dad instincts just kicked in and he just grabbed a bit of cotton wool and just cleaned baby up. And uh, I could see him afterwards, he was holding this bit of cotton wool and I was like, are you, are you okay? And he said, I can't throw it away, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what to do with it. So it went in the memory box. And he was like, are people not gonna think that's weird? I was like, who cares? It doesn't matter, that's your memory of you taking care of your little boy. Uh, and that's, that's what he needed to do. Um, so we need to make sure that care is accessible and appropriate. And this kind of goes back to the, um, the thing about you know, conversation timing and things like that. Um, but any new parents' minds are basically mush. For bereaved parents, that's, it's even worse. You know? um, so we're firing a ton of information at people, and we're going to be asking them to make massive decisions. Um, but there's other things to consider too. So quite often... I don't know, on labour on labor wards, the labour rounds can be a consultant, a middle grade doctor, a junior grade doctor, an anaesthetist, uh, a shift coordinator, and sometimes an advanced practitioner. Most of them just stand there in the room, don't pay much attention. And that's, it's not really appropriate at the best of times, but when you're dealing with losing your baby, that's the last thing that you want. Um, so I think we need to try and be kind of gatekeepers a little bit. And, uh, and yeah. It's, it's important to try and protect these parents from all of that rubbish. Uh, going back to choices and information and empowerment. I think a lot of people worry about giving information to parents because they don't want to get things wrong. Um, and I'm just going to give you a few of the basic tips that we give to our, our midwives. Um, So make sure you won't be disturbed. Sounds obvious, but people are in and out of hospital rooms every day. And if you're having important conversations, just stick a don't, do not disturb sign on the door. And uh, yeah, I make sure my page or my phone are at the front desk and we'll stick a sign on the door and put the kettle on. And we just settle down to have conversations. Um, I don't know many people who, even at the best of times, can take in a lot of information and then make a series of massive decisions. So you have to be prepared to give information in stages um, and also introduce the idea of different conversations. So sometimes I'll, in the morning, I'll say to somebody, how do you feel about discussing funeral arrangements a bit later on today? And then I'll give them the chance to call me back in or I'll pop by later on and say, is it okay if we have a chat about that now? And then I'll give the information but not necessarily expect anybody to make decisions at that point. Written information is helpful. Um, not everybody's going to want it, to be honest. Not everyone can sit and process that information instantly, but it's still important to have it. Um, yeah. As I say, be prepared to go over the same information more than once. Um, there's a lot of things to, to talk about and a lot of conversations. And be prepared to have these conversations with different people. So parents maybe want to be by themselves. They may want other family members to be there for support. Or it may be that, you know, dad's going to be organising certain things or, you know, it's been delegated to, to grandparents. Um, and it's, it's appropriate to involve the wider family, but it's also important to try and make sure that that's what parents want. So going back to funeral arrangements, we had uh, a couple recently and grandma was arranging the funeral. And we quickly, quickly realised that initially it was just because mum and dad couldn't, it just seemed like too mammoth a task for them to do. But actually, a few days down the line, it became massively important for them to be doing that and for them to make that celebration of their baby's life. Um, so we, we kind of stepped in and, and had a word with grandma and she was quite happy to take a step back. and. Uh, and something that seemed like a mammoth task and just completely impossible actually became quite a healing um, process for mum and dad. Uh, we have to respect choices as well. We don't know what people are going to want. We don't know how people are going to react. And uh, ultimately, it's their choice. And again, don't rush for decisions. Um, and give people a chance to change their minds as well. So good communication with parents is absolutely vital, but so is good communication between healthcare professionals. 
parents are probably going to be on the ward for a few days and they're going to see a succession of uh, healthcare professionals, midwives, doctors, most of whom are going to want to have conversations or ask them questions. Uh, and if we can communicate effectively amongst ourselves, it can reduce stress and strain on parents. Um, and if discussions and conversations are clearly documented, it should mean that parents uh, aren't being asked one thing four times and another thing's completely missed out. Quite often, communication with parents, like I said, is one of the things that midwives tell me that they're worried about, specifically giving the wrong information or not knowing the answers. And uh, I always say it's okay to say that you don't know, but it's important to follow that up with, but I'll find out for you, and then go and do that. There are a raft of people that you can contact, from your bereavement midwives to shift coordinators, um, people from charities. There are so many people out there who want to help and give you the answers. Um, no one's expected to know the answers to everything. And parents are not going to be upset with you for not knowing instantly. It's better that they, you know, you say, do you mind waiting and I'll give you the right information than to give information that's potentially confusing. Um, and just don't put too much pressure on yourselves either. <laughs> One thing that really helps with um, communication are bereavement care pathways. I don't know. Some of you may be familiar with these. Some of, some of you may not. Um, but they've been developed to try and aid good communication and try and in, um, ensure consistently good, sta hand, good standards of care, um, but also making sure that care can still be personalised. So these, these pathways are by no means prescriptive, no means prescriptive, um, but they give a good idea, but it, sometimes it's necessary to deviate. Um, so in Greater Manchester, we use the... The, two, the stillbirth integrated care pathway and the second trimester pregnancy loss integrated care pathway, which is a massive mouthful. Um, and I also know that the SANS national bereavement care pathway has been rolled out, and I think they use it in York, um, possibly. I haven't seen that pathway, but I imagine it's got a few similarities. So these are great because they just lay out different aspects of care um, and give prompts and ideas. So the sections are things like immediate care around diagnosis. And diagnosis isn't necessarily a word I like, but it is the word that's used in our pathway at the moment. Um, and it covers things like initial conversations, initial investigations, um, as well as practical things like cancelling appointments and giving car parking passes. So that's things that parents just don't have to worry about. Um, then there's things like timing of delivery and care surrounding delivery. So this is discussions about induction, um, finding out what expectations and fears pa parents may have about labour and delivery, and then trying to address them as best you can, as well as starting to introduce things like seeing baby and memory making. Um, care of baby and examination. So this basically covers all the memory making things. It's a list of suggestions of memory making. And um, it highlights the fact that we should be offering the chances more than once. If parents aren't sure the first time, offer again at a later date. They may still say no. It may be that they've changed their mind and actually they do just want that opportunity for somebody to ask again. Um, it goes on to things like uh, timing of delivery and care, and delivery, care of baby, care of mum and family and investigations after delivery. It talks about things like funeral arrangements and taking baby home, postnatal follow-up investigation. Uh, appointments so parents should have the chance to come back and speak to their consultants, get investigation results, ask questions and find out what's happened. Um, when you list things like that, it can seem like it's quite a tick box exercise and it's almost a bit transactional. But when you're using it, it's actually, it's really good because it just, it breaks things down into little chunks and it just makes it much easier to manage uh, for midwives and, and student midwives and people providing care. So training and education is obviously a massive thing. Healthcare professionals, we never stop learning and we never stop wanting to learn. But I think it's fairly widely acknowledged that training around bereavement care can be fairly hit and miss. And that's for qualified midwives as well as student midwives. Um, and the fact that we're all here on a Saturday morning shows how important it is and how wanted it is. Uh, SANS did an audit, audit of bereavement care that was published in 2016, and they found that less than half of hospitals had compulsory bereavement care for <coughs> qualified midwives. And of that half, uh, so of that half, only half 
had 30 to 60 minutes and 3% had a full day, which is fairly shocking, really, considering. Um, so there's been various studies, and pretty much all of them say that most student midwives feel unprepared, even in their final year, to provide care. And things, factors in this are lack of experience in providing care. So I think students are kept away from bereavement in practice. Um, and it's, for better or worse, you know, some people think that students should be focus, focusing on normality and that bereavement care is too, too big, it's too scary. But it's even scary when you're a newly qualified midwife and your first experience is you go into that room and care for that family. And with all the best wishes in the world, the NHS is understaffed. You know, you don't always have another midwife supporting you. Um, so you do the best you can, but it'd be slightly easier if you were more prepared. Uh, the communication, going back to those difficult conversations and things like that, um, it seems to be a big thing that comes up time and time again. There's, it seems to be a just deal with attitude, this particular study, um, and a couple of others came up with uh, that kind of, well, you kind of have to do it, just, just go and do it, you'll, you'll be okay. And it's, it's not good enough for students, it's not good enough for midwives, and it's definitely not good enough for families. Um, and the opportunity for reflection, so the chance to sit down with somebody and talk about what happened, what you did well, what you didn't do well, um, is something that people find is missing. So there are so many different charities and organisations providing um, bereavement training, but it seems to be that the impetus is on the individual to try and access that training. These are just a few of the different people, and I'm sure there's people that are here today that I've missed off. Um, but again, it just shows how, how needed it is. So one massive factor that I think is so important that isn't really talked about a lot is um, emotional resilience for students and for midwives. Um, so this is, there's a lot of different quotes and I don't like, um, yeah. There's a lot of quotes saying what emotional resilience is and uh, it's, yeah, it's process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma or tragedy, bouncing back from difficult experiences. Uh, it's important that we try and learn how to develop emotional resilience, and it's something that I think we're not particularly good at all the time, but I think it's becoming more recognised how important it is. Um, so it's important to have a network of support, both inside and outside of work. People that you can go to and say, I'm not happy about this, or, you know. And it's important to have people who um, will challenge you as well. So when you say you're fine, they know that you're not. Um, because otherwise we're just, we're all too good at saying, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. But actually, it then snowballs and we get to the point where we're really not fine. Um, identify and access resources. I actually changed this to being aware of your emotions. Again, I don't know why that bit's in there. So, as I say, it can be very easy to ignore things until it snowballs and gets on top of us, but actually being aware of emotions and addressing things early um, is massively important and it can, stop things from becoming overwhelming. Um, it can also help us to recognise those times where saying no is the healthy thing to do. Uh, if you don't feel like you're fully able to care for a family because of whatever else is going on, it's okay to say no. You're not going to be doing anyone any favours by trying to muddle through. You're not doing yourself any favours, you're not doing them any favours. Um, and I think, I think saying no is something that we all need to learn a bit better. Or at least saying, yeah, but I'm going to need some help. Uh, Work-life balance, I think that's, you know, that's a universal challenge for everybody, isn't it? And I don't know that we'll ever get that completely right. Uh, Self-care is kind of one of these buzzwords that's going around at the moment. Um, but I do think it's important. So it, it's basically the actions that we take uh, to ensure our own health and well-being. And I think it's come to mean the little things that we do to kind of treat ourselves. So going out for a gin and tonic on a Friday night or, you know, going to yoga or sitting in your pyjamas having net, like watching Netflix all day. But it's also about, um, at a fundamental level, it's more about the little things that we have to do every day. So getting dressed, doing the food shopping, doing the washing up. And if we're getting to a point where we're not able to do those things, then something's drastically wrong. 
Um, and again, this reflection is so important. I'm not saying we all need to sit down and knock out a full Gibbs model reflection every time there's an incident or every time we look after a family. But taking that time to reflect on the care is massively important. Find out, you know, think about what you did well, conversations that went well, things that you could adapt in the future. Um, and it's, I think all those things together help you to then deal with the next situation. Uh, so I'm going to jump now to memory making and I'm going to whiz through this a little bit um, because I know that there'll be various conversations and, and talks about things like this throughout the day. Um, <coughs> most hospitals now I think have um, memory boxes provided. These are just a few and I couldn't actually find a picture of the Our Angels one um, but we've got the Four Lewis one, we've got Simba, uh, Sam's and that's, that's actually a picture of one that somebody brought in or a picture of a picture that somebody brought in for, they wanted their own memory box. And um, these are so important because they, when, a, when an adult or an older child dies, we have shared memories, we have experiences to fall back on. That's not the case with babies, so it's important to make the most of that time that we have to make those memories. Um, and these, these are fantastic because they just, they provide a starting point, but they're by no means where we should stop. Um, these are just, I just put these on. So a lot of the um, memory boxes have certificates. These are ones that were designed for us by, by an artist, a uh, friend of mine. We used to have certificates um, that were kind of, they were all beige and they had this really like somber looking teddy bear on. And uh, thankfully we ran out of those towards the end of last year. So we were able to order some new ones. And uh, some of them might have gone missing. Um, and to be honest, a lot of our older midwives were really, really dubious about these. They didn't want to give them out. But actually, the reaction from parents has been quite positive. They want things to be bright. They, you know, these parents wanted things to be bright and colourful. They wanted it to be celebration and acknowledgement of their babies rather than this sad-looking beige teddy bear. So this is... So these are Hannah and Andrew that I mentioned before, and this is their second daughter, Isabel. Um, as I said, photographs are massively important. And um, I think even the way that we take photographs has changed in the past, even five years since I qualified. Um, so I know that previously, when I'd seen photographs, they'd kind of just been baby in a cart, sometimes baby being held. But um, it's almost like a full-on baby photo shoot now. So my mum actually took these photos of Isabel and um, there are thousands and thousands of photos from the labour, the delivery, Isabel's first bath getting changed. Uh, they took her for a little walk around the unit and uh, they, they just kept, managed to capture so many different memories. Um, and I just think it's massively important. Hand and footprints, so the ones on the, this side, are Rosie's, their oldest daughter. The ones on the right are Isabel's. And as you can see, there's a little bit of difference in the quality of them, which is quite sad because I think they're so important. Um, it, they can be difficult to get right first time, but just keep trying. I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so I go through a lot of paper and ink wipes and stuff. But I'd rather do it 20 times and give the parents one good set than just kind of go, oh, it's, it's been really difficult, and then give parents something that's a bit smudgy and just isn't necessarily the best. Um, we also do clay hand and footprints. So we do the ones on the left, um, but I have seen that some hospitals do the, the moulding as well, which is, they're absolutely fantastic. And um, there's just an example in the middle of there of some of the things that people do with these hand and footprints. They don't just go in the memory boxes and uh, they get turned into other memories as well. I can see all the parents here looking at their different things. <laughs> uh, dressing baby is so important. It's what you do with your baby. It's, you know, you dress baby, you choose the outfit, you wrap baby up, you make sure baby's cosy and comfortable. And uh, sometimes parents are prepared and they have all their little bits and pieces. Sometimes baby's quite early, things just aren't going to fit or, you know, they're just not prepared. Um, 
most hospitals have a stash of stuff. We've got a whole room full of stuff. And uh, it amazed me recently to find out one of our midwives, he, he's worked there for maybe 10 years, didn't realize that we had this room. So she had wrapped baby up in a little hospital blanket. And when I was like, come and choose some clothes, she was just amazed by all the things that we've got. And um, there's so many different people that are providing things nowadays. So you've probably heard of, on the top left is um, a little outfit from Heavenly Gowns. So they're the ones that are made out of donated wedding dresses and things. Um, they come in kind of this big to full term. Um, and then on the right are actually George at Asda make Premi baby clothes and they're absolutely fantastic. Again, they come for like two kilo babies. And uh, I love being able to give parents those when their babies are a bit smaller because they just didn't expect to find anything that would fit their baby. And it just adds that little bit of dignity back to that baby and that family. And uh, babies are cute when they're all dressed, so, you know. These are just a few other memories that Hannah and Andrew have got in their memory boxes. So some of these are from Rosie, some are from Isabel. Um, the top left one, she didn't actually know that I was talking about. Um, she'd never heard me say about the dad with the cotton wool. And I didn't know that she had this, this tissue from Isabel either. But basically, she had done exactly the same thing. Isabel had had a bit of a nosebleed, she'd wiped it up. And she actually carries that around with her everywhere. And uh, the, in the middle is the nightie that she was wearing when she had Isabel, and it still smells like her. And the, um, the tissue usually lives in a little Ziploc bag as well in her bag, and she just takes it out and gives it a sniff every now and again, which she says makes her look a little bit crazy on the bus, but she doesn't mind. Um, the top right, she kept some of the um, cards and things. Anything that said condolences or sorry for your loss just went straight in the bin. She barely even looked at them. But celebrating her baby girls, they went in the memory box. Uh, the bottom, the scissors are the scissors that they cut Isabel's hair with. They also have the scissors that they cut Isabel's cord. And um, she wanted me to put the bottom left picture in because it just represents anything with the girls' names on. Um, for her, and I'm sure for most parents, it's just massively, massively important to have their baby's names recognised and written down and real. Um, I think she said she's got, I've got notepads where she just writes her baby's names down. So jumping on to uh, bereavement rooms and kind of spending time with baby. Uh, it's recommended that all units should have a bereavement room. I think it's something like 63% do you have a bereavement room. But these provide, it's almost like a bubble. Um, sorry, Chris is flicking things around. It's almost a bubble where parents can just spend some time with their baby without worrying about the outside world. They don't have to worry about what else is going on and think about going home. Um, so this is our bereavement room. The top left is how it used to look. It was fine. It had a Murphy bed that was quite temperamental. Um, in the hospital, the chairs were just normal hospital waiting chairs, and there was, it would vary how many were in there. It had a kettle, but it didn't have a fridge, so milk would quickly curdle if you didn't keep an eye on it. Um, but one of our families raised some money through Four Louis, and uh, Bob and Tracy did an amazing job at helping us to renovate it, and it's, it's just a really beautiful room to spend time in now. And, uh, I think they're just so massively important. I was looking after a family recently and um, they'd come in, baby had passed away at 23 weeks, they'd come in for induction and I took him into the, the labour room next door and it's just a normal labour room. And it was just, they were obviously devastated as they would be, but we just couldn't get anywhere with conversations. I was trying to ask questions and, and kind of start the process off as it were. And they were just devastated, you know. And uh, we went next door, we went into this room, and uh, we put the kettle on, we closed the curtains, uh, and within 10 minutes, Grandma had her feet up on the chair, Dad had his feet on the table, and Mum had arranged all the cushions behind her back. And uh, we were able to then talk about the next steps. It just added comfort and dignity and removed the fear. Um, so yeah, I think they're amazing, bereavement rooms. Uh, most of you have probably seen cold cots and cuddle cots. They're kind of a, I don't want to say unfortunate necessity. They're not the nicest things. They're not always the prettiest things. And 
quite often it can be quite hard for parents to put their babies in this cold cot because your natural instinct is to keep your baby, baby warm and cosy. Um, but I think people are trying to make them a bit nicer nowadays. So the, the kind of boxy ones you can get inserts and all sorts. And then there's the cuddle cots that are the cool mattresses. Um, and the little one on the top is actually about that big. Um, and we've got some that are made out of like ice cream tubs and stuff as well that people have knitted covers for. And it sounds really crazy, but they're actually really sweet. And uh, being able to put a baby in a size appropriate Moses basket, again, is just, it, it adds a bit of dignity. Um, it's important to have space to remember as well. So this is our bereavement garden at the hospital. Um, it had a £10,000 renovation earlier, the, like last year. Um, and so before it was quite dark and overgrown, it was half the size, so that's, that's only half of it. it, the same size on the other side. Um, it was just, it was a garden, a memorial garden in name, but nothing else. So it's been renovated, parents can have plaques there, it's got this sculpture that was chosen by some of our, our parents and things. Um, and I walk past every now and again, and it's, I don't think I've ever walked past and there's not been at least one parent in there, um, come rain or shine, it's just, it's a really nice place to be. Um, time to remember is also important. So we had our first wave of light service in our garden last year. Um, I don't know if you all know about the wave of light, but Baby Loss Awareness Week is the 9th to the 15th of October every year, and it culminates with the wave of light. So 7 p.m. every 15th of October, people are encouraged all over the world in their own time zone to light a candle for at least an hour. The idea is that if everyone does it around the world, it creates a 24-hour wave of light. Um, so we invited parents to come down to the hospital and we did it in the memorial garden and it was absolutely stunning to be honest um, we had a short service at the beginning but then parents just they milled around and you know they took photos and they found the baby's plaque and put the, the candles with the baby's name and, and it was also a great opportunity for them to kind of meet each other we hadn't really thought about that aspect but people were swapping numbers and, and things um, and we also have the annual rem remembrance service every year. And most hospitals do things like this. And it's just, they're massively important. Um, because everyone wants to, you know, everyone wants to remember their babies. Um, so yeah, bereavement care is not the easiest thing to provide. It hurts to come alongside a family who's hurting. It just does. Um, but I heard a quote recently and it, it did stick with me. And it said, change comes about in the margins. Um, so this isn't necessarily about every single one of us radicalising care and changing services massively. Yeah, we should be able to do that as well. But at the heart of it, it's about each one of us coming alongside a family when they need us and remembering that you do have the capacity and you do have the ability to provide the fundamentals of care, one family at a time. Thank you.